So for today, I'm going to do a quick presentation of the speakers that we have. Uh, we're going to do a five minute Microsoft Graph overview. Then we're going to dive in into looking at several of the new set of functionality that we've released in Microsoft Graph over the last few months. And we're going to do a deep dive on using Microsoft Graph with Python. And, and then we're going to go into that Q&A section that I mentioned before. So for the folks that are today on the call, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Yina Arenas. I'm a program manager on the Office Extensibility team, and I've been leading Microsoft Graph for uh, over about three years now. And to, with me today, uh, there's several folks that are working on the Microsoft Graph tooling team. First of all, Luis, Luis Maresca. He is an engineering manager on the Microsoft Graph tooling team. So oh, this is a team that does Graph Explorer and the SDKs and some of the experiences that you see on graph.microsoft.com. Then we have uh, Dimitri Pimenov, who is a PM on the Office Platform team as well, leading some of the tooling work around the SDKs and figuring out how we do great things like, for example, experiment on calling Microsoft Graph through GraphQL, or like how do we get closer to developers across different languages and technologies. And finally, we have Doug Maug. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Doug. And Doug is uh, working on our content team, and he is going to be sharing today some work that he's been doing around Python and how to make it super easy for developers that are using Python to interact with the content that is behind Microsoft Graph. So that's the folks that we're going to have uh, in the call uh, speaking today. But we also have several other Microsofties on the line who are going to be helping out with questions that you might have and are putting on the IM window. So with that, I'm going to go into Microsoft Graph overview. And before I get there, I wanted to share that Microsoft Graph is one, it's a, it's a really a Microsoft-wide initiative. So there are a significant amount of teams behind the Microsoft Graph. This is not just coming from one team or one building in the Redmond campus at Microsoft. This is a consolidated effort across many, many different teams that uh, put together the data and information from our customers behind a unified programming interface. So with that, uh, the Microsoft Graph basically is an endpoint that enables developers to access information across the different services that Microsoft has as part of their cloud offering. So whether it is information that is sitting in the directory with users or groups or some other of the directory objects, or information sitting in your OneDrive or your mailbox, or even the devices that are managed by Intune. All of this information across Microsoft services, across Microsoft 365, is exposed in the Microsoft Graph as a unified endpoint that your application can call uh, and get access to all of this information. It is hosted on graph.microsoft.com, and it enables you to act, make simple quests, simple requests over HTTP to get information about the user, the group, and the organization uh, for information that is within Microsoft services. Like, for example, the profile information of a user that includes their photo or the details of their profile, or some of their content, like their files, their calendar, their manager, the users in the organization, their groups, whether it is a team, uh, a team chat, or whether it is a calendar in a group, all of this information you can access through the Microsoft Graph. Now, the Microsoft Graph is also growing significantly. It started about three years ago with around APIs for 30 resources. And uh, fast forward, actually like two years, fast forward this time, we now have APIs for over a thousand resources within the graph. So the, the surface area of the resources that are exposed is exponentially growing over time. So I mentioned that the graph is an API over HTTP. So basically, it's a REST-based API that you can call on the graph.microsoft.com endpoint. It follows a simple standards. So verbs indicate the request intent, whether you're getting information, creating or updating information, or deleting information. It has two versions. One that is the v1.0 version that is supported publicly for your apps to use in production. And it has a beta version, which is an experimental version in which we put the latest features before we graduate them into V1. 
then you can navigate the API to access the different resources that are exposed in it. And uh, from there, from addressing one of the resources, you can navigate to one of either the members of the collections or properties of those resources. Finally, you can navigate to related resources and navigations, like for example, growing from a user to the files that the user last modified to um, who actually modified those files. So being able to navigate that th th those relationships across the graph is one of the value propositions of connecting all of this data together. And then this is an API that you can use query parameters to interact with the data that is being returned, whether it is formatting results with select and order by, controlling results like filter and expand, or paging with using top or, or skip. So that's the whirlwind uh, up the, uh, overview of what the Microsoft Graph is. And with that, we're going to move into the next session of the, our community call in which Dimitri Pimanov and Luis Maresca are going to share some of the new things that we have on the Microsoft Graph. We're going to start with Microsoft Teams. Thank you, Ina. So, so Microsoft Teams is you know, one of those world-class collaboration engines that not only lets you um, do modern chat, but allows you to do teamwork tools, and it, it's very highly customizable, lets you build applications within the application itself. Um, it also allows you to extend the application using bot frameworks and actually build things within the app. But one thing that's really powerful here is the, the addition of the graph, um, and it allows you not only build applications like daemons and script APIs, but also actually interact with teams and channels uh, you know, remotely, whether you want to build an application in a service or you want to build it within a desktop app. And so what we want to actually show you here is the ability to not only create Teams, and, uh, which is a new functionality within the beta endpoint, but also fetch your existing ones, but even be able to actually send messages and create chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop over to the, the, the famous Graph Explorer that everyone loves. Um, and in here, we actually have the ability to show more samples. And what I'm going to do is down here, I'm going to actually initiate the Microsoft Teams beta uh, samples. And what you'll see here is now I get a whole bunch of new additional samples on Graph Explorer. And those of you who are not familiar with Graph Explorer, gives you the ability to not only just sign in with any account that you want or not sign in at all, just use our demo account and actually generate um, using sample messages that we have here. And again, this just allows you to click samples and initiate what samples you want to see. But for our case, we want to actually see what teams I'm joined. And what you'll notice up here is it actually switches the beta endpoint and I get to see exactly what teams I'm joined uh, I'm sorry, what channels are, what teams I'm joined down here, and then I'm going to actually pull up the, 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 the actual channels that are available to me. And the way I do that is I can actually grab this guy, and I'm going to put the group ID in here that I actually saw before, and I'm going to delete this group ID and run this message here. And what you'll notice is I actually now get, this is now a little bit more information about this particular team. And what I want to see is, I actually want to see what kind of channels are available on there. So what I'm going to do is um, I actually can run uh, a query that shows that what channels are available. And the way I do that is I just do a slash channels on there. And then from there, actually, I can, I can actually post messages. So if I wanted to post a message um, or I wanted to create a channel or chat thread, I could do that. And in here, I can do a hello world to actually create the, 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 the chat message for a specific chat thread. And so what I'm going to do is go back to channels. I'm going to grab the channel message that we had before. Oops. Go to history. It's okay. I'm going to go down here to history. Ba -ba -ba. And I'm going to grab this particular channel. And I'm going to create a thread. And of course, it replaced that. So let's do this. Okay. And I'm going to and I'm going to create a thread, a message on that thread, and boom! Now I actually sent a message saying "Hello world." Now if I pop over to uh, my IT department, we see "Hello world." So now, now Graph Explorer not only gives you the power to test and sample and experiment, but also gives you the ability to kind of interact with some of the new beta endpoints and the power of Microsoft Teams. Um, so next, what we're going to do is we're going to show you a little bit more about um, some of the new endpoints that are available and some of the new functionality, and starting with uh, Dimitri and the education information. Thanks, Lewis. 
Uh, so, education is a new set of APIs available in beta on the Microsoft Graph. We're really excited to announce these APIs. These give you resources for education like schools, classes, school terms, users, and assignments. So you can work in a really idiomatic way with information that's related to education. You can do things like create, publish, and grade classroom assignments. And you can use the EDU APIs um, with educational tenants that support Microsoft Data Sync. So you can sync down all of your roster information from an SIS service and uh, access all that data through Graph. One of the other new APIs we're excited to talk about is Office 365 Reports. And the Reports API is another API that's available in beta. And it provides a number of different reports that let you fetch rich information about usage of services within your organization. So this is great if you want to monitor how are people using uh, email or even things like how many Office 365 active uh, users I have per day. And each of these lets you query for both a range of days or a particular day. And it lets you pull in data that makes you, that lets you keep a pulse on what service utilization looks like. Um, so some of the service, the reports that are available for these services are things like Office 365, SharePoint, Skype for Business, and Yammer. The next API I want to talk about is available in V1, and that's SharePoint Lists. Um, so I'm going to jump back to Graph Explorer and show a quick demo of pulling in list information as well as um, item information within that list. So back in Graph Explorer, I can go to the sample queries and pull in the SharePoint list queries. And once I have those turned on, I can browse to um, listing uh, looking at the list in my root site, and I see I have a couple different lists available. And so I can do something like I can grab one of these lists. Pull that in, and now I have this list available. And some additional things I can do with lists is I can pull in the list items by appending items. And I see all of the row level data for that list. And if I want to see each of the fields, it's just as simple as doing an expand on fields. And once I run this, I can, I can see all of my field level information, things, columns like created, modified, even the custom columns I have in the list. So this makes it really simple to create, update, modify lists, and list items. And today we have this available in V1, so this is production ready. In addition, we have uh, some additional properties currently available only in beta. So for list items, you can pull in item versions, and there's some additional list level information also available in beta. So the next API, uh, Lewis will walk through, and that's Outlook. Thanks, Dimitri. So we all know that Outlook, um, the API, is a pretty powerful API. It lets us interact with not only our email, but all of our contacts and information, um, all of our calendar items and our invites. But one thing that it really you know, adds functional value here is the ability to not only find rooms, but also allow those rooms to be part of my, um, you know, whether it's my meeting request or um, you know, being able to find times and locations for us to meet up. And so the power of the graph kind of adds that functionality, but it also adds some really neat functionality to this as well. Um, and some of that functionality allows me to you know, look up what supported languages people are actually, uh, my system supports, as well as the different time zones that are available. Um, so, but kind of to demo really quick the ability to do uh, finding rooms, all you have to do is go back here and just do a find rooms. And what you'll notice is immediately it gives me a list of uh, rooms that are available. I can also look for rooms lists. And so if I do the room lists at the end of here, it gives me a, a list, a set of room lists that I can actually look inside and say, okay, you know, maybe there's some rooms with this in this particular building or within this particular list. And I can actually uh, also look at supported time zones. Um, and so um, I can actually pull that out of here. Um, and I'm going to add Outlook in here. And what this allows me to do is, you know, what kind of time zones are available and what ones can I use in my meeting. Um, and that kind of lists out them here. And then finally, the, the last one is what supported languages are available. 
and it kind of shows me the different languages that are available for me. But if I want to actually go in here and um, and add a particular time, what I can do is actually use uh, find meeting rooms times. And so that's actually within uh, this guy here. And what I can do is um, I can actually post a message to this. Um, and that allows me to actually review um, whether the specific attendees has some time and whether that particular room is available. And, um, and I can just post that message and I can get the available room times. Um, also, if you look in the samples down here, there is the ability to kind of look at the different Outlook and Outlook Mail and Outlook Calendar uh, demo accounts as well. And so demo samples. So check those out uh, for any additional ways of doing things uh, with Microsoft Graph. Um, next, we're going to jump into the Intune functionality. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, so we have an updated beta available for the Intune API. And Intune is a really large API that lets you do a lot of things around setting policies for resources and devices to enforce compliance in your organization. Uh, so for instance, you can manage the applications your users have access to. You can bring in custom applications for iOS VPP, things like um, line of business applications you have developed in-house. You can track the installs, their availability. You can also enroll and manage company-owned devices. For instance, you can set policies for Windows 10 around password complexity, password expiration, VPN rules. There's really a lot you can do here. Um, we have documentation for all of these resources and these APIs available on the Graph uh, website, graph.microsoft.com. Um, but this is a really powerful new addition, and we're really excited to see what you'll do with it in tune. So to segue, Doug is going to walk us through uh, some Python scenarios and um, some of the better together stories with Microsoft Graph uh, and Python. Thanks, Dimitri. So um, to, to kind of put this in perspective, um, we have uh, some new samples for Python that I want to show you. Um, but I think I'll start with showing you uh, how, how we look at various platforms for Microsoft Graph and where this fits in. So if you go to graph.microsoft.com, as Yina mentioned, that's the endpoint for the API, but there's also all this other developer-focused content here, documentation and so on. And what I want to direct your attention to is, is we um, have a graph developer story for many different platforms or languages. And so if you look here, these are um, various samples and SDKs that we have. Down lower right is Python, and those are the samples I'm about to show you. Um, but one way to look at this is we have certain languages and platforms for which we generate an SDK that provides all sorts of rich functionality around Microsoft Graph, hides a lot of the details so that you can just get to work and get productive. And then also for any modern language that supports REST, that supports HTTP, um, it's just a REST endpoint at the end of the day. So you can just hit that REST endpoint and do creative things with Graph. So what I'm about to show you is REST samples for Python. And uh, Python is big these days in data science, machine learning, AI, those sorts of domains. Uh, there's a lot of data in Graph, a lot of interesting analyses that can be done with that. Um, so the reason we're providing these Python samples and a uh, way to get started with Python with Graph is we see some value there for um, those who work with big data in Microsoft Graph. So I'm going to now, um, let's see, let me get to a prompt here, pardon me. How do I get back to my taskbar? There it is. Okay. So um, I'm going to go to a command prompt. Um, the samples I'm about to show you, um, we've tested them with PowerShell at the bash prompt and also at just the old-fashioned Windows command prompt. And what I've got here is I have already cloned the repos of several of these samples to show you so that we don't have to do that right now. Um, with Python samples, um, if you're familiar with Python, you might be aware there is this concept of a requirements.txt file that lists the dependencies. And then you can do pip install requirements.txt and so on. Um, what I've done here is created a virtual environment that has all of these dependencies already installed. That's kind of the recommended thing. And so I'm just going to activate that virtual environment and then we'll be ready to run all these samples. And um, for the first one that I want to show you, um, I'm going to run it here in Python 3.6.3. That's the current version of Python, uh, as you can see right there. Um, these samples will run in any Python 3.x version. Um, they will also run in Python 2.7 with very minor changes, and that's addressed in the readmes of some of these samples. So let's get right into it and look at one of these. Um, the auth samples here, I'm going to show you um, 
a link to this. Uh, let's see. Should have had this one already loaded. So um, if we go to our samples here, Python dash, uh, there it is. Okay, so the, the auth samples here, what this is about is, as you may know, to get access to graph, you need an access token. So you need to authenticate with Azure AD. I'm um, not going to dwell on the details of that, but this right here shows what uh, kind of the casual jargon is three-legged OAuth, the um, um, authorization code grant workflow. So what this is showing here is for um, each of these auth samples for several different auth libraries that you can use with Microsoft Graph, um, we, we have a sample to show you how to use that with a popular Python web framework. So you could look at this as kind of a, um, think of it as a two-dimensional table. We've got a bunch of different auth libraries, Microsoft ADAL, the one that we provide, also requests OAuth Lib, Flask OAuth Lib, and then uh, we also have various web frameworks. And the samples I'm about to show you, it's either Flask or Bottle. All of these samples do the exact same thing. They just call up your user profile and show that information. And so the idea is it makes it really easy for a Python developer to look at the code for these samples and see how each compares to the other one um, to help you decide which approach you want to use. So let's just try one of these out. I'm going to um, fire up a Flask sample that uses the Microsoft ADAL library. And I'll show you briefly what that code is all about. Uh, here is the sample. Uh, so in Flask, uh, the way it works is you decorate routes like this. So that says that the home page function handles the just the root route. Login is handled by a different function and so on. Um, these are the auth steps. And then what this does is after everything is authenticated, it just calls graph the me endpoint and it returns your profile data. So if I go run this sample, right there. It'll be listening on localhost 5000 and then I can go fire up a browser and just go to that. So here I will open a new tab, localhost 5000. So all the samples look exactly the same. They just do this, let you authenticate. Here I'll authenticate as myself and you can see my name and email address and so on. And that's it. Uh, very simple, very trivial, but the, this now we are connected to graph. So, for example, I could go into that sample and change that slash me endpoint to slash me slash messages, and now I would see the most recent 10 messages from my inbox right here, or I could change that to slash me slash contacts, and I'd see my personal contacts and so on. So all of the navigation of the graph endpoint that Eno was showing you earlier, um, you can do all of that once you have a token or authenticated in this way. So that's one of several auth samples. We have these auth samples for Flask or Bottle. We're going to do uh, a new sample for Django that will be out soon. Um, so regardless of which popular Python web framework you use, you can use one of these samples to authenticate. So now let's look at some, doing something a little bit more interesting. Um, I'm going to send email and show you how we send and receive email with Graph. Uh, so here, we'll open this up in VS Code to show you the code. Okay, so this is our send email sample, and um, for each of these samples that actually do something more interesting than just show your user profile data, we've provided one or more helper functions um, so that Python developers can reuse those functions in their code. Um, so in this case, we have um, a send mail route here that uses this send mail function, and um, this right here is the line of code that actually sends an email. So you see it's just calling send mail, it's passing our graph connection that's authenticated, as I just showed you in the auth sample. And these are just postbacks from the form. We have a form where we enter a subject and some recipients and so on. And then down below, this here is the helper function we've provided. So it's just simple and straightforward. You just pass a subject, recipients, the body, some attachments and so on, and call send mail and you get an email sent. So if we look at that one, here, running it, go back here to uh, authenticate, and here I'll authenticate under my ID here. By the way, you'll notice it's not going to prompt me for my password here. I've already authenticated, that password is cached. Um, so for, um, there are various things you can do 
these auth libraries. And one of the concepts is we can do silent sign on if we want to and, and not even get this prompt here, but rather I'm already authenticated as Doug Mayhew at Microsoft. Um, we can go straight to this form. So various options there. So this here is just a little form for sending an email. I can put some email addresses there. I can put a subject and so on. So I'll just put uh, greetings from community call. Just so we know that one's different. Notice you can put um, HTML in the body. And if I click the send message button, so that just hit the graph endpoint, the response 202. That means the response was accepted. Uh, a subtlety there for those who aren't familiar with these REST response codes, um, response 200 means success. 202 means accepted. The subtle difference is we don't know. Maybe um, dmayhew at Microsoft.com isn't a um, valid email address at Microsoft.com. So graph is just saying, hey, I've accepted your crest and, and I'll, uh, I'll have at it. Um, if we go do another, show you a few things here. Um, if you if you put a bad address in, um, Graph looks at the request here, sees that, and says, "Whoa, that is not an email address." Um, so it's telling you in a very straightforward, plain English way here. Um, error invalid recipients. It's telling you that the error is that at least one recipient isn't valid and the invalid recipient is bad address, isn't resolved, and so on. So what I want to show you here is when we had success, when we called Graph and sent an email, we didn't get any JSON payload back. But if we had an error, we get a very helpful and straightforward error message here. Also shows this request ID. You can optionally send an ID with every gra Graph request. Um, so that helps you with debugging to know which request caused which error, those sorts of things. So those are a couple examples of sending a mail. Now what I want to do is um, segue to let's look at how to read mail, and then we'll also uh, see the email we just sent. Uh, let's see. So for this one, um, I think it's probably worthwhile to show you um, a basic concept here. Graph has various endpoints that will um, return paginated responses. So let's say um, there's a graph endpoint um, slash me slash messages that returns my email. Well, I might have 10 emails, I might have 1,000 emails, I might have 10,000 emails. Um, so it's not going to return all of them. It'll return a page of results. And the basic concept is, for all of graphs um, collections like that, is it returns a page uh, that has a certain page size. The default for messages is 10, and I've just left that at 10 here. And then each page of results that we get back also includes a link to where the, um, you can, the, the endpoint that you would call to get the next page of results. And so you can just step forward. You basically get back a JSON payload that includes this OData next link, and that points to the next page after the current one. So to see this in action, I go there, fire that one up, and then go back to the samples here. Local host 5000. And so what this is showing me here, and I'll just quickly zoom through this. Um, this is now going to show the first page of my email, and then I can just kind of step through these. So you can um, notice the skip parameter here. This is showing how we get pages of results. Now that's all well and good, but um, for a Python code, Python um, is really powerful in its use of iterators and collections. And so there's a basic concept in Python that for loops you would say, for example, for message in messages and just loop through a bunch of messages. Um, to do that this way with pages, it's very clumsy to have to think, oh, are we done with the page yet? Do we start a new page? And so there's a simpler way to do this. And um, here, let me pull up. In Visual Studio Code, I'll show you the code. Um, the simpler way to do it is with generators. And generators are supported in most modern programming languages. In Python, I'll show you exactly how this works. Here is a graph generator helper function that we provide. And notice it's really trivial. It's just a few lines of code. And what this does is for a specified graph endpoint, so in this point case, we're just going to start with me slash messages, uh, it returns one after another each an uh, individual entity in, in those collections uh, without you having to think about pages. It retrieves a page here. So this is where it gets a page. Then it yields 
from that page, however many messages are in it, and then it gets the link to the next page. So it, as this iterates through those messages from the developer's point of view, you just call next message and you get the next message. There's no other, um, there, there's no um, need to think in terms of pages. And you could, um, this function right here, I should mention, um, .NET and other languages have the concept of generators, so you could follow this exact same practice in other languages. This isn't just a Python thing, but rather a, a more generic approach to how you create a generator that steps through these collections. So to see that in action, if I go back here, uh, pull that up. So here, if I pull this up, I should see our uh, community call email that I just sent. Uh, well, I have a couple other things. So there it is, and I can just step through these messages. Um, so um, this this is just stepping through the messages here, and maybe um, to to put this um, kind of in perspective, what's going on on the left there is the actual console output of the server. So as I step through each message, you can see that um, it's doing another get to get the next message. And then as the developer, I'm just, it's a one liner, I'm saying next message to get each of these. Um, here soon I will get to the 10th message and then see how it retrieved the next page over there in the left. So from the developer's point of view, there's one line of code that just says next message, put that in a loop and away you go. Um, so this is a very fundamental concept that applies to messages, to um, contacts, to all sorts of collections, say the items in your OneDrive root folder, all of those are handled in the same way with pagination like this. Um, the Graph Explorer we looked at a little earlier, uh, Lewis and Yina have showed you some things with that, and I want to go back to the Graph Explorer and show you something here now. Uh, let's sign this out, and I'm going to sign in with a test account that I have here. Uh, that one right there. Okay, so um, one of the concepts that Graph supports is what we call open extensions. And um, the way to look at this is it's custom metadata that you can add to um, a variety of entities in Graph. I'm going to give you a feel for how many different things you can do with open extensions right here. Um, so the idea is there are certain entities in Graph that support open extensions. If you look at this supported resource column here, these are um, the various entities in Graph that you can add custom metadata to. And this little chart right here is just showing you which endpoint you would call in Graph to work with that, and then what permissions are required. Um, a concept regarding permissions there, most of this work with open extensions is going to require either admin consent or an admin account, which makes sense if you think about it. We are now storing additional data in your O365 tenant or in your Azure AD tenant, and uh, so an administrator should decide whether it's okay for this app to store that data there. So uh, if I go back to the Graph Explorer here, and I've logged in with this test account, and uh, here, let me clean up our samples so we can see this very easily. Um, you can select categories of samples, and I'm going to go back and just select the open extensions category. Uh, here. Okay, turn that off, turn that off, turn that off. There is a little bit of a delay coming into the Skype window. Oh, okay, okay, good to know. Okay, so so here we have extensions as a category of samples in Graph Explorer. And the extension samples here, I'm um, just going to cut right to the chase and click the first one, get an open extension. What this is showing us is at the me endpoint, you see right there, so for the current authenticated user, this uh, demo user here, mod administrator, uh, it's selecting a few fields, returning from their user profile, and the key concept here is expand equals extensions. So that means down here it is showing all of the extensions associated with this node, with this user. In this case, that's an empty list. There are no extensions associated with this user. Um, however, now I can go, uh, let's put this side by side if I can. 
Okay, if I go to our open extension sample, and um, I'm going to fire that up here. Here, I'm going to try to make this side by side for you. Okay, so over here, I have our open extension sample that I'm running. And what this sample does is it lets you log in as a user and then um, save, imagine user preferences. This is a common scenario in graphs. So say you have an application that has some settings, a color theme or whatever, and you want to associate that with the user so that those settings roam with that user to other devices, to other sessions, to other browsers. That's what's going on here. If I click red, um, what has just happened here in the sample app is it has saved an open extension on this user node that says this particular user prefers red. And if I go back over here and say get an open extension, you notice now there's some data down here. We have an extension um, that says color is red. So now if I were to shut down this browser and go log in as this user on another device or whatever running the same app, it can go read that setting. The setting follows the user around. And likewise, if I click green here, it'll say green over there. And then um, I can also, I, I could even go change this in Graph Explorer and we'll see it on the other side. So for example, um, here is a patch to update an open extension. And, uh, oh, pardon me, I need to get the ID. Notice this here, this ID, graph-sample, graph-python-sample, that's what identifies this particular set of extensions. And there could be more than one in here. In this case, we just have color green, but it could be a whole host of settings for your user preferences. So if I go here um, to, I'm going to fill the screen with this so it's a little easier to see. If I go in here and say, I want to, for, oops, didn't get that, so graph-python-sample. There is the identity of our open extension, and you'll recall that one only had a color. So I'll go color here, and um, let's change that to, I don't know, change it back to red. Um, so now if I run this query, I've done a patch, and if we get our open extension, we can see that says red. And so now if we go back here, and refresh our screen, we see, oh, pardon me, I just overwrote what we had just done. Um, well, here, I'll tell you what, I'm going to uh, just kind of keep moving on this one, but um, the, the basic concept here is that interplay between what we see in Graph Explorer and what we see in the sample. And then to show you the code behind that to give you a feel for how that works, and again, this applies regardless of what language you're um, working with graph in. But the Python code for that, we've provided two helper functions that are um, open extension read and open extension write. Each one just takes a connection to graph, takes an extension name, that's like our graph Python sample that I did, and then the entity you want to associate it with. So that's any of those endpoints that were in um, that table of endpoints for open extensions. So those are a few of the examples of what we have um, in the way of samples for Python REST developers. Uh, we're very interested in your feedback on these samples, um, and also not just for Python, but for any language. Um, I'm with the team that creates samples for Graph to support the work that Ian and Lewis and Dimitri and others do to um, build the Graph API. So if there is a particular scenario of something that you're interested in seeing a sample in any language, we would love to hear about that. Um, any of the sample repos, you can log an issue. Um, you can also go to um, Stack Overflow if you have questions about how to use Graph. There's a variety of ways to get a hold of us with that. One final thing I want to show you is for anyone who's using um, the existing graph um, Python SDK. We have an SDK um, that is out there and that we have deprecated as part of this. If anybody imports that SDK in their code, as of today, there's a new little message they get that just tells them it's deprecated. However, all of the functionality of the SDK is still there. So um, like just for example, there, there's a whole object model behind this um, for any code that uses the SDK. But going forward for Python, um, because of the ubiquitous use of requests, the HTTP library in Python, we've decided to build an approach around 
around the request library that uh, based on feedback we've heard from Python developers, we think that will work best for most Python developers. Um, so that, that's a look at uh, Python in graph. Um, one, one final thing maybe to let you know um, regarding the Graph Explorer, um, this is just kind of a cool thing that applies more broadly than the samples I just showed you. But if we go back to the Graph Explorer here and just get our me endpoint like this, um, this returns our user profile data. And actually here, um, I'm going to sign in as myself because I don't think that test user has an about me. But what I want to show you is um, when you call graph, it aggregates many different services. Recall that slide that Ina showed you that showed Outlook, OneDrive, SharePoint, et cetera, et cetera. All of those services are aggregated in graph. So um, when you call one of these endpoints, you may be hitting multiple graph services to get the data that you're getting out of there. So in this case, um, let's just go to me, and I'm going to add a, um, let's see, a OData query parameter, and I'm going to say about me and mail. So let's get those two fields out of my profile. So down below you can see it says about me, and that's from our internal SharePoint site, my description, and there's my mail. Now, where did that data come from? In this case, it's much more complicated than you'd think just looking at that. About me came from a SharePoint API, and my mail information there, that came from an Azure AD API. So an interesting thing that you can do on any graph endpoint is you can just add dollar sign what if to the end of that, and it's going to tell you where Graph got that information. And here, this is a little clumsy because of um, it doesn't wrap in there, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to just open Notepad um, just so we can see all that. But so this is showing us it executed two requests in parallel, it merged the responses, the first one hit SharePoint to get that about me, and the second one hit this endpoint there to get my Azure AD info that is my email address. So the dollar sign what if parameter is a very powerful way to look at how Graph is getting that data and aggregating that data behind the scenes for you. Uh, so I just wanted to leave you with that one tip for how to use the Graph Explorer. Uh, so that's the Python story for Graph. Well, thank you, Don. Thank you so much. And a lot of the things that you talked about there apply not only for Python developers, but also for .NET developers. So things like paging and how to handle that with generators is one thing that you can do no matter the language that you're developing with. So with that, uh, we're going to continue with the rest portion, next portion of our presentation, which is um, community contributions. So we want to call out some of the things that we've seen recently. This is by no means an extensive uh, list, but we want to, like, highlight some of the community contributions that we've seen recently come along from mostly our MVP community, which we uh, love and appreciate a lot. So here we have a, a list of some of the, of the content that our MVPs have been putting out there that are great ways for you to learn how to use uh, the Microsoft Graph in very specific scenarios, whether it is with Azure Functions or PowerShell or uh, Power BI. So mm, some of these uh, folks have been gone doing a lot of work to putting blog posts out there. So we wanted to make a call out for them and thank you for those contributions. And also for, for everyone else, these are great ways to see examples of real world use of the Microsoft Graph and walkthroughs on how to uh, achieve specific scenarios. So with that, uh, we're going to jump to the next session, which is Q&A. At this point in time, we're going to stop the recording. So um, and then we are going to open microphones. And if anyone wants to jump in and uh, uh, ask a question,